Okay, so um, I want to welcome everyone in person and online to this uh, special seminar today. My name is Jing Liu. I'm the managing director of Midas, the Michigan Institute for Data Science. So uh, before I introduce the speakers, I want to just mention a few housekeeping items. Uh, next week, we have three seminars, Monday, uh, Tuesday, and Wednesday, as you can see here. Um, and then uh, I want to thank our uh, sponsors for our seminar series and all the major events, uh, Rocket Companies, American Mathematical Society, China Scope, Microsoft, Yazaki, and General Dynamics. So today uh, we have two speakers, one uh, here at West, uh, at uh, West Hall and one online actually. So uh, Dr. Ken Coleman is the Friedrich Huitwell Professor of Political Science, also a research professor at the Center for Political Studies. So his research covers very diverse fields, computational social science, comparative politics, American politics, European Union studies, uh, federalism, comparative political parties and elections. And he writes for the New York Times and the Washington Post. So when it comes to teaching, he created and administered a new minor and a new major in international studies at the university. And the major has grown into one of the largest at University of Michigan. Um, he also has a very popular textbook on American government. When it comes to data science, he co-founded and is co-principal investigator of the constituency level election archive, which is the world's largest repository of elections results data. So Dr. Yuri Jukov, who is online today, is an associate professor of political science and research associate professor with the Center for Political Studies. His research focuses on the causes, dynamics, and outcomes of conflict at the international and the local levels. So as we all know today, how important the topic is given what's happening right now in the world. Um, so his uh, methodological areas include spatial statistics, mathematical computational modeling, and text analysis. He has published widely in many journals. I'll name just a few here. American Political Science Review, Foreign Affairs, International Organization, International Studies Quarterly, and so forth. I can stand here for a long time reading the list, so I won't. Um, today's topic is actually very interesting. Um, you can see that this kind of uh, analysis, this uh, not only applies to uh, political science, but really wi widely applies to any kind of spatial data. So I'm going to pass it to Ken first. Oh, Yuri. Okay. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, all right, so I'm, I'm going to assume that uh, I'm coming through loud and clear and that you can see my slides. Uh, if not, um, you know, we can see you, but not the slides right now. OK, so I'll reshare the slides. Here we go. OK, is that coming through? There you go. Terrific. OK. Uh, thank you, James, and thank you, Jing. Uh, this is a real pleasure to be here, and I apologize that I'm not able to uh, attend in person. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, uh, Ken will uh, will be on standby to take all the incoming flack. Um, now, uh, before we begin, I want to just give credit where credit is due. This is a co collaborative project, not just between myself and Ken, but also uh, with a graduate student from our department, uh, Marty Davidson, and a colleague of ours from Davidson College, a former postdoctoral fellow at CPS, Jason Byers. And this is part of a, a, a broader initiative that we've been working on for several years to build a data infrastructure for subnational geospatial data uh, that we hope to launch uh, later, um, either later this term or later this year. Um, and this a paper emerged out of a persistent problem that, that we have faced, um, a problem which actually transcends both this project and many others. And this is the fact that in 
social science, but I think this is a much broader problem than just that, theoretically relevant units of analysis do not always align with the data that are available for you to analyze. So the spatial units at which data may be available are different from the ones at which your theory is specified. So just to give a couple of examples here, um, what you see here are three different maps of Ukraine, three different sets of geographic boundaries. Let's suppose that uh, a researcher is conducting a study where the dependent variable is a set of elections for governors, for instance. The independent variable or treatment is collectivization during Soviet times, so the uh, collective farms that the Soviets uh, uh, organized in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, and let's say that there's an instrumental variable, uh, let's say rainfall, which can be used to uh, as an exogenous source of variation in, in crop yield. And we want to somehow put all these data together and actually test a hypothesis about how Soviet era collectivization affects incumbent vote share in these gubernatorial elections. So the outcome variable here might be uh, measured at the level of provinces. Uh, the treatment here, uh, collectivization, might be measured at the level of districts as they existed in the 1930s, which may be different from the districts that exist now. And in fact, the map in the middle is of Ukraine as it looked in, the, in 1933 before uh, Crimea became a part of its territory. Um, and then the instrumental variable here, rainfall, may be available for another set of units, say grid cells. Um, a typical data format here is a like half degree wide uh, regular grid cells in which rainfall and temperature are measured, um, which are about 110 kilometers across at the equator. And so theoretically, you're interested in variation across regions in support of gubernatorial candidates. But what you have instead is three incompatible data sets with different types of geographic support, provinces in one of them, districts in another, and grid cells in a third. Now let's consider another kind of, kind of example where this problem may emerge. Let's say that you have data for the same type of unit, provinces, but those units themselves have changed over time. They may change in where the boundaries are. They may change in terms of the names of these, these units. Uh, the size of these units might differ uh, as well as the number of these units. And so here, on, all the way on the left is a set of Ukrainian provinces from 1937, then 1945, and then 1991. Um, these units, some of them have the same names today as they did back then, others do not. Uh, the boundaries do not align. And so even if you could match them by name, they do now 100% align with each other. And this is a problem with any kind of research that, ha that occurs over a long time horizon, that where well, the time horizon is long enough for the maps themselves to change. Uh, but it's also relevant for any effort to track changes, say, in political preferences over time or changes in any local attitudes over time. Just think about redistricting in the United States. And now let's consider a third example. So here, the data are measured at different levels of geographic precision. So even if you're looking at data from the same year, these data may, may differ in the geographic precision at which they are measured, depending on what's being measured and who is doing the measurement. Um, so some variables may vary only, only at the country level, but they value, vary over time. Others may have more micro level spatial variation. And you still somehow have to make some tough decisions about how you're going to integrate these types of data. Then in a fourth example, which is the last one that, that, that I'll throw you here before getting into the topic, is that even if you have the same type of unit for the same year, you know, these units may look different depending on which GIS data source you're using. So here you're seeing maps of the same types of units, allegedly, from three different uh, data providers for geographic boundaries. The one all the way on the left is GADM or um, uh, well, I forget what exactly the, the, the acronym stands for, but it's, these are, um, there's a large free da data source of, of free um, uh, administrative unit boundaries uh, for last, that are contemporaneous. Um, then the one in the middle is um, a data set that was actually released by a unit within the United Nations called GAL. And in their case, these admin two level units, which are districts or like counties in the United States, uh, they actually do not have those boundaries. What they call admin two is actually admin one. 
And all the way on the right here is another uh, data source called GeoBoundaries, uh, which align much more so with the, with the first of these, but still the, there might be slight uh, differences in, in boundary placement, slight differences in precision. And so, you know, these data may look different depending on what source you're using. And it may differ in the placement of, of boundaries, the level of detail, decisions on how to treat disputed areas, so how to treat Crimea, for instance, um, you know, whether to actually recognize Russia's annexation or not. Um, how they treat boundary bodies of water and how they define the unit it, itself. So one of these three here is not like the other, but this is just illustrative of the larger problem that we often face. So this creates a dilemma for researchers. Choice number one is you conduct analysis at theoretically appropriate units. So let's say we just pick grid cells and we just conduct analysis at that level. The problem here is that's only possible if all data are available for those same set of units. The alternative here is to somehow convert these data to a common set of units that are more appropriate for what's theory. Now, these units may not 100% align with those specified by your theory, but they may be close enough to what your theory dictates. But this is a tricky process. Um, this is a pretty messy step often, oftentimes. Uh, it's one that scholars routinely do, but rarely do they uh, make explicit the, the many choices that they make in this process. But the thing to note is this kind of spatial transformation always entails some information loss. It can lead to both measurement error and biased estimation of various quantities of interest from a simple mean to regression coefficients. And in a survey that we did in our paper, we found that about 20% of, uh, of empirical political science articles published in top journals over the last 12 years did some, var some variation of this. Uh, most of them were not terribly specific about what exactly they did or how. So this problem is pretty well known in geostatistics. Um, it's a literature on this going back decades. Um, and that literature has resulted in a lot of spatial transformation options. There are a lot of algorithms that uh, enable these kinds of tr spatial transformations. But there's no one silver bullet that dominates the, the rest. And in fact, our purpose in this paper is not to identify that silver bullet, is to so basically to show scholars how they can make informed decisions among these many choices with the data that they have. And even though within political science or within the social science more broadly, there's increased attention to this problem, there are still no best practices as of yet for how to implement this, for how to compare different options against each other, or how to evaluate the results that you get. And that's where we come in. So before uh, getting into the, into the mathematics here, uh, let me just begin by defining what we mean by change of support problems. I've been using this term changing as change of support. A geographic support is here defined as the area shape, size, and orientation associated with a variable spatial measurement. Well, where this becomes a problem is when you try to make statistical inferences about a variable at one support using data from a different support. So when you try to make inferences at the grid cell level from data that was originally collected at the, prov at the province level. So that would be an example of a change of support problem. Now, this is closely related to several other problems in a metallurgical topics and uh, geo in geostatistics. Uh, and um, one of them, which you may be aware of, is the ecological inference problem, which is the general problem of trying to deduce micro-level variation from aggregate data. And also the modifiable aerial unit problem, which is when you try to make statistical inferences, uh, um, but those statistical inferences themselves depend on the geographic regions at which data are observed. And when you change those regions, when you change those boundaries, when you change the scale, you may reach very different conclusions. So both of these are viewed by statisticians as special cases of, of uh, change of support problems. Uh, in each case, infer inferential problems arise primarily due to the grouping of data into larger units, which is called the scale effect and MAUP or aggregation bias and EI, uh, or they may arise due to differences in unit shape and the distribution of confounding variables, which, which is called the zoning effect and MAUP and the specification bias and EI. Um, now, the problem that we're discussing here is a bit more general. I mean, both of these things represent some of the issues that arise when you attempt to estimate quantities of interest in one set of geographic areas using measurements from another. Uh, but they're part of a more general story. 
And, and our, our point here is that a solution to the ecological inference problem by itself does not necessarily apply to other types of change support problems, like horizontal transformations between non-nested units and some of the other challenges that we're gonna discuss here. So in some respect, what we're describing here is a bit more abstract and more general than either of these two uh, more well-known issues. So our contribution here is mainly to help researchers navigate these problems. What we do here is we introduce a couple of measures for the ex-ante assessment of how complex a change of support operation is likely to be based on the relative scale of the units being transformed, you know, whether one is larger than the other, whether you're aggregating and disaggregating or doing some hybrid of the two, as well as how well nested the source and destination units are. Um, whether one set of units falls completely and neatly inside of the other. And we're gonna formally define these things in a minute. And what we show is that these measures are strongly predictive of the quality of transformations in terms of how much information you lose. We show that with election data from the US and Sweden and the Monte Carlo study with artificial data. And we also have a physical software package in R uh, along with some validation procedures that allow scholars to assess the quality of these transformations uh, with or without the kind of ground truth data that you often need for validation. So let's get into it. Um, and by the way, if I'm ever you know, go, going too fast, or if you have any questions, just feel free to interrupt and, uh, and, and chime in. Uh, it's harder for me to see the, the hands that are raised uh, uh, remotely, but, uh, but by all means, if, uh, if, if you have any clarifying questions, please, please go ahead. Um, so the first uh, measure that we introduce here is relative scale. And to give you some intuition for this, uh, let's consider three sets of units that you see here. Um, so all the way on the left, you see uh, electoral precincts, voting precincts in the state of Georgia. In the middle, you have constituencies or congressional districts. And all the way on the right, you have this kind of uh, honeycomb hexagonal grid, um, regular grid covering the entire state of Georgia. And we're gonna try to you know, change the support from one of these into another. And so suppose, to begin with, we want to change the support from precincts to constituencies. So in this case, our source units are these voting precincts, our destination units are these much larger congressional districts. And we begin this transformation by intersecting one with the other, which is the intersection that you see in the middle. And in terms of relative scale, the basic question that we're asking is, are the source units smaller or larger than the destination units? And in this case, it seems pretty straightforward. Precincts report to constituencies during the administration of elections. So it makes sense that one will be smaller than the other. And in fact, what you see here is, yeah, every single one of these uh, precincts fits into one of these uh, larger constituencies. And in terms of nesting, the question that we're asking is, do source units fit completely and neatly inside these destination units? In other words, do you need to split the source units up in order to distribute them across destination units? And here, the answer is yes. They seem to fit pretty completely and neatly within the destination units. There are a few kind of strange areas here on the coast where some of the precincts kind of go out into the Atlantic Ocean, but for the, for the most part, you know, we can attribute that to differences between data providers and, and how these things are measured um, um, you know, at the precinct versus constituency level, who's collecting the data, uh, what level of precision the boundaries are, are in. But overall, we know, you know for a fact that uh, during the administration of elections, one of these is subordinate to the other. So it would make sense that precincts would be you know, mostly nested within constituencies. So this seems like a pretty straightforward example of an aggregation of nested units. So you're going from smaller units to bigger units, and those units are nested within each other. Okay, so that seems pretty straightforward. But let's take a look at a more complicated uh, example here where we're, we're trying to change the support from constituencies to grid cells. Now the source units all the way on the left are these larger congressional districts. The destination units is the is this regular grid. And when we intersect the two of these in the middle, we have is a much messier picture than what I just showed you on the previous slide. And here it's not as clear immediately whether the source units are overall smaller or larger than destination units. It seems like they're, they're larger um, 
for the most part. There are some areas here in the Atlanta metro uh, region where some of the congressional districts are in fact smaller than the, than uh, than these grid cells, but for for the most part, especially in the rural areas, they are larger. And on this question of whether source units fit completely and neatly into destination units, here it's pretty clear that they do not. Right? It's pretty much every single one of these constituencies is going to need to be split up into multiple parts in order to fit into uh, one of these grid cells. So this is a much more complex uh, change of support operation. We can roughly describe it as being mostly a case of disaggregation into non-nested units. But this is also not something you'll always be able to, to eyeball, especially in, in the context of batch processing, where these decisions have to be made automatically you know, over dozens and potentially hundreds of different data sets, which is part of our needs here for the SunGeo project. And so some considerations here. So many of these kinds of challenges, uh, change of support operations, require a combination of aggregation and disaggregation. Um, there are going to be some parts of the map where you're going to be moving from smaller units to larger, and there are going to be others where you're going in the opposite direction. Oftentimes, this will coincide with urban-rural uh, divides. And also, just because these units are politically nested does not mean that they are geometrically nested. Right? When you render these things on a computer screen, depending on who collected these data and how precise the boundaries are, you know, there may be measurement error issues and imprecision that results in some, some uh, imperfect nesting like what we saw on the coast uh, of, uh, of Georgia there on the, uh, one of the previous slides. And it's sometimes unclear how you know, scale nesting affect the quality of spatial transformations. Um, this requires some additional analysis. To get a better read on this, we also need quantitative measures. We cannot simply depend on our own eyeball assessment of, of scale nesting in these cases. So some quick formalization here. So we're going to use uh, the letter G to refer to these different maps of polygons. G1 is going to be the source polygons um, at which our data are initially available. G2 is a set of destination polygons, which are more appropriate for our theory. And these are the data which we want. These are, are the polygons for which we actually want to run the analysis. Um, the third bullet point here uh, is the intersection of polygons one and two which is that middle uh, plot that I showed on the previous slides. And then for each of these polygons, both you know, within the source, within the destination and within the intersection, we're gonna calculate the area of each polygon and their individual intersection. And when you intersect two polygons, I mean, that tends to increase the sample size. So you'll have at least as many intersections as the larger of N1 and N2. Um, so intersections essentially tend to split up polygons into smaller pieces. So with that notation, we can now define you know, the first of our measures, which is relative scale. And relative scale can be understood as the share of intersections of these two sets of polygons in which source units are smaller than destination units. And this is something that ranges from zero to one, where zero indicates pure disaggregation. None of the source units, uh, in, in that sense, are, are smaller than the destination units. You're going from larger to smaller units. And values of one indicate aggregation. You're going to universally larger uh, units in, in, uh, in the destination. And so to give you an example of this, so suppose you're doing a change of support operations from counties to congressional districts in the state of Michigan. Ann Arbor is at the intersection of two polygons here, Washtenaw County, and Michigan's sixth congressional district. So if, if Washtenaw County is smaller than the sixth congressional district, then this, qual this quantity becomes a one. And if Washtenaw is larger than the sixth, this quality becomes a zero. And you do this for every intersection of counties and congressional districts, and then you average them all out. And then that gives you this measure here. So that's our first measure, relative scale. The second is relative nesting. And this could be roughly interpreted as the share of source units that cannot be split across destination units. Now, this is related to several measures of diversification, including the, the Herpendahl index, uh, as well as uh, the Gibbs-Martin index of diversification, which the electoral redistricting literature has used to assess whether 
community, communities of interest like neighborhoods and towns remain intact under alternative district maps. And so the intuition here is that if a source unit is fully nested within the destination unit, then the intersection will encompass its entire area. And so this fraction here will become equal to one. And if that's the case for all units, for all intersections, then this will average out to one, indicating full nesting. But if a source unit has to be split up into multiple parts, you know, these individual fractions are, will be less than one each. And you know, the theoretical limit here is it, it will eventually approach zero if, if uh, the source units are split into, uh, up into so many smaller pieces that you just have no nesting whatsoever. And anything between zero and one here is a case of partial nesting. So let's apply this measure to, uh, to the data that we were looking at a moment ago in Georgia. So here we have precincts, constituencies, and, and the grid as A, B, and C. And we see here that moving from precincts to, uh, to constituencies is a case where you have a relative scale coefficient of, of one indicating pure aggregation and relative nesting coefficient of pretty close to one, but not complete, not completely. So it's still mostly fully, almost fully nested, but not quite. And if you move in the opposite direction, you get the opposite picture. So if you move, say, from constituencies uh, to precincts, from this one to this one, the relative scale coefficient is zero, meaning pure disaggregation, while the relative nesting coefficient here is also pretty, pretty close to zero. Now, this, these are not going to be complete mirror opposites of each other, um, in part. Um, so, so it's not, so, so one minus, uh, you know, th this number here is not going to be, you know, 0 0.08 here in the in, in, in the other corresponding off diagonal element of this matrix. And that is because uh, in, in this case, some of these grid cells uh, cover territory that falls outside of the boundaries of either of these two polygons. They, they, I mean, there's a bit of an underlap there. And as long as there's some underlap, um, you know, this is not going to be you know, purely symmetrical, but we also have symmetrical versions of these, met of these metrics that we include both in the R package and in the um, uh, in the paper itself. And we see here that moving from constituencies to grid cells, uh, kind of that, that second uh, example that, that I showed you is going to be pretty messy. Um, you know, relative scale coefficient closer to zero than to one, uh, relative nesting coefficient, which is not quite as extreme, but also pretty low. And so this tells you that, um, you know, going from precincts uh, to constituencies, or even from the grid cells you know, uh, to constituencies is going to be you know, relatively easier, less complex uh, th than it would take uh, you know, to go with disaggregation between non-nested units. Now, you know, we, we could do the same thing for other units. Uh, in, in this case, we, we did the same analysis from Sweden. Um, very similar pattern here. I'm not going to go through this in, in detail, I'll just uh, uh, show you that this is not uh, simply something that's unique to the U.S. redistricting case. Um, what's interesting about Sweden here is that some of the precincts are actually uh, larger uh, than, th than these grid cells, because up here, all the way in the north, very few people live there. That's, these are rural areas. So, um, um, so the, this metric here is you know, precincts to, to grid cells is not going to be you know, one. Um, but overall, you know, we see a similar pattern here. Now, the question here is how much does any of this really matter? Um, so we compared transformations here uh, across units of varying scale and nesting uh, here in, in that we did, um, uh, uh, so, so we considered a, s a set of uh, changes support algorithms, uh, which are, I'll describe on the, on the next slide. Um, for each of these algorithms, we transformed a variable in the election, election data, which is the competitiveness uh, of elections in those units, uh, which is essentially one minus the winning party vote margin. There are several ways to calculate this, but actually um, the closer this, uh, this measure is to one, the more competitive an election is. So this is a pretty standard metric in the election literature. And using the precinct level uh, vote, share, uh, vote share data, which is kind of an irreducibly uh, lower level unit of analysis here. Uh, we don't have data on individual 
votes that individual people cast, just what's reported at the precinct level, we can calculate the true value of this competitiveness measure in each destination unit. And we can compare that then to the transformed value of competitiveness, which one gets by changing the support from one set of units into another. And then we compare you know, you know, the, uh, these uh, X hats to, to the Xs across all these units in the, in, in the destination polygons, and we see how closely they align. And there are several uh, algorithms that we considered here. Uh, they range from very simple geometric operations, kind of like this Venn diagram, to much more complex model-based transformations like this Rube Goldberg device over here. Um, and um, these include some of the more common uh, tools that are, are recommended by geostatisticians uh, like block creaking, as well as some very simple uh, geometric operations like simple overlay and, uh, and area weird interpolation, as, as well as some, some new ones that, that, uh, that Marty, uh, one of our co-authors developed, uh, TPRS forest uh, thin plate uh, regression spline. Uh, in random forest hybrid. Um, and what's happening under the hood in, in these uh, you know, individual algorithms is described in the paper, but for the purpose of this illustration, we're just gonna try to summarize how well each of them does in comparison to each other. Uh, we don't have necessarily have a dog in this fight. Um, and we look at several diagnostic measures of the quality of the transformation, including root mean squared error, a normalized version of it for scale dependent extensive variables. We'll look at Spearman's rank correlation, as well as estimation bias in an ordinary least squares regression, which is uh, how we do that is we basically generate some fake data, some um, simulated data, where we set the true value of the regression coefficient to be 2.5. And then we estimate uh, what this regression coefficient is by regressing uh, the synthetic variable on spatially transformed values of x. Um, and so here's what we get uh, through each of these uh, different algorithms. Each of these maps uh, illustrates the distribution of, of, um, of the transform values of competitiveness of elections. Uh, over here, you see the true values as derived from micro level data or lower level data. Um, and over here, we see how the same variable looks across all these different algorithms after the change of support operation. Um, some of these are clearly messier than others. The universal creaking here does not look great, to be honest. Others, some of, the, some of these simple ones like overlay actually do not look all that bad. And neither does TPRS AW. Um, and this is how they look uh, when we do a, a transformation from constituencies to grids. This is the second example that I, sh that, that, that I, um, I showed earlier. Um, so in the first one, again, this is a simple case of, you know, aggregation of almost perfectly nested units. The second case is much messier. Uh, there's mostly disaggregation between non-nested units. And here, yeah, it's a mess. Um, so, some, some of these look closer to the distribution of true values than others. Um, this one over here does not look too bad. Uh, TPRS AW also. Um, and also, I mean, we can look at these maps and try to eyeball which of these, which of these looks best. Um, yeah, or you know, we could uh, basically hold the algorithm constant and and uh, and, and see how well uh, each of these uh, 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 transformations does uh, as a function of of, of uh, relative scale and bias. So overall, what we see here is the following: um, the higher the relative scale and the relative nesting, the lower the root mean squared error. So each of these dots is. Uh, you know, the root mean squared error from each of these individual uh, uh, maps that you see here. Um, we also see that the higher the relative scale and the nesting coefficients, the higher the, the Spearman's correlation uh, between transformed and uh, true values. And while this is a bit noisier here, but I'll show you some, be some better plots in a, um, in, in a moment here, uh, we, we do have smaller OLS bias uh, as we move up, uh, you know, the scale of you know, relative scale and, and relative nesting. So overall, it seems that the higher the relative scale, the higher the relative nesting, as you go more toward aggregation of nested units, there's better performance across the board. Um, we also performed a series of simulations um, in the Monte Carlo study where we use artificial boundaries and variables 
uh, covering a, a much broader set of hypothetical transformations, covering the entire range of RS and RN. And here we have two use cases, one where we change the support of a scale-dependent intensive variable, and another one where we change the support of a scale-dependent extensive variable. So it's kind of like the first of these is like population density or vote margins, where you're interested in the mean of that variable in the, in the, in the destination units, whereas the second one is something like, like event counts and population counts, where you're interested in, uh, in the sums and you want the, the mass to be preserved in some way. You want the, the sum of, of the total in the destination units to be equal to the sum of the, in the population, for instance, in the, in, the, uh, in the source units. And so how much does this actually matter uh, in, these, uh, in this much broader set of simulations? So for each of these simulations, we, set, we draw a set of random polygons, source and destination. We assign true values um, of this variable you know, to units in both polygons. Then we change uh, the geographic support of that variable from one to the other. Um, so these are just a couple of examples of what these random sets of polygons look like. Um, so these are very simple Thiessen uh, tessellations. Um, you know, and we did you know, thousands and thousands of these. And then the underlying distribution we generated from a Gaussian random field for extensive variables and from an inhomogeneous versus homogeneous Poisson point process for uh, extensive variables. And, and in, in each of these cases, we looked at both an autocorrelated version of, of, the, of this variable and a spatially random version. The autocorrelate being you know, more resembling what the data look like in reality. Um, now, um, I'm not going to go through this in, in very much detail because I want to leave time for, for questions. Um, but essentially, we just did the same exact analysis that we did for Georgia uh, a moment ago, only for this much broader set of units. So for each transformation, uh, we looked at the diagnostic measure, say root mean squared error. We regressed that on a cubic spline of, uh, of relative scale or relative nesting to detect potential nonlinearities, you know, fixed effect for each algorithm. And what we find is this. The same story as before. The higher RS and RN are, the lower uh, the root mean squared error. Um, this, is, it, it, this is the case for, for um, um, I'm not sure. oh yeah, for, yeah. So, so here we see relative scale, we see relative nesting. In this plot, uh, same story for both of them. Um, these two variables are actually positive co positively correlated. Um, we also see a positive correlation between RS and RN and, and, uh, and Spearman's correlation, both sets of metrics. And we see a reduction in OLS estimation bias. Here, you know, it's moving from attenuation bias to negative bias all back up to close to zero. Here, there's a bit of weirdness going on with a bit of inflation bias uh, for intensive variables, which then kind of flattens out uh, to the point where it's relatively unbiased estimation for um, higher values of RS. Um, it seemed very similar pattern with um, uh, the relative nesting coefficient. So this is the same results only broken down by algorithm. Uh, we can return to this in Q&A if you're interested in how individual algorithms perform. But the bottom, bottom line is we see mostly the same, the same pattern across uh, all of these algorithms that we considered. So uh, our general recommendation from, from all of this is that researchers should take these measures, report them as ex ante indicators of transformation complexity. Um, and this is something that you know, scholars should do before they run the analysis. Uh, but certainly after they run the analysis, they should also report these measures in their papers so we know how much faith to put into uh, these transformed values, which we know from our simulations and analyses can be pretty out of whack uh, if the RS and RN coefficients are on the low side. Um, you can also look at you know, these visualizations for some face validity checks uh, and implement some sensitivity analyses with alternative change of support methods. Um, and a lot also depends on whether ground truth data for uh, validation is available. So this can be micro data, this can be lower level data that are at a level below which they are, not, are no longer released. Um, and you can use this to validate the transform values uh, in a similar fashion to what we did here. Um, and if you're in a really good scenario where you have, we have units that are well nested, you can simply match on a common ID and avoid that this whole mess. But in most situations, you're not going to be that lucky. Of course, if these ground truth data are not available, then you can do some partial validation for a subset of the data, which 
uh, these lower level data are available um, and kind of extrapolate out from there. Um, you can also do a meta-analysis or um, uh, you know, of results from various algorithms and various routines. Um, and then you can also, as an alternative to change of support operations, move into more hierarchical multi-scale modeling direction, which goes out beyond the scope of this paper, but it's certainly uh, an option that's available for some users. Um, we have an R package that implements this stuff. Um, it's available both on CRAN and GitHub. Um, and it, it includes uh, routines to calculate the, these nesting metrics, um, as well as some basic geoprocessing tasks. And we're adding additional stuff to this package pretty constantly. Um, so that's, I've gone too long. I'm going to stop there. And I very much look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuri. Um, so for those in the virtual audience, um, you can either raise your hand and ask your question out loud. I'll be able to unmute you. Otherwise we do have a Q and A section uh, and I can read those questions out loud. Got a handful of people here as well, no pressure. Uh, if you guys wanna ask a question, I can pass this microphone over to you. Um, but really super fascinating talk. I'm, I'm not an area expert or anything, but I like GIS a lot. So this was really cool. Thank you for your talk. Um, so I have two more general questions because this is not my area. Um, so uh, what would be the usage of uh, using those polygons for what use cases you would use that instead of the map? Because uh, what makes sense to me is that uh, typically boundaries of a nation uh, imply some rules to the people living there and there are some regulations and all that that will affect their choices, their living style and many other things. So it makes more sense to me to go with the boundaries of that area rather than using polygons. But it's interesting to me to see where those might be useful. And uh, a second question, so I will ask both of them uh, so that you might they might come along. So you you also talked about using Monte Carlo simulation. I would uh, when when you say that I'm some a bit concerned about how you are gonna generalize uh, what you mentioned or what you get through those simulations because Monte Carlo simulation goes with with what you added to the simulation, and I'm wondering if what happens in real world will be considered in that. Uh, so whether you cover all those uh, variables or not, or what would you answer to that? Yeah. yeah, you want to take that? I can give it a shot um, and uh, Ken can jump in as needed. So I, I think, um, so in terms of use cases, um, it, yeah, this is one of the benefits of, of presenting this to, uh, to an inter interdisciplinary audience, I think. Um, because in, um, in political science, uh, a lot of the analysis that we do, even that lacks analysis that lacks uh, an explicit geospatial component is, is often done at the level of administrative units, like, like US states or US counties, um, which are represented in a GIS context as polygons. And, and we, we use these units, uh, on a, uh, the theoretical basis for it is that these are the units at which political decisions are made. Um, so if one wanted to study policing, for instance, like a, a police precinct might be a, a unit of analysis that's appropriate for that analysis. And, um, and, and you would try to get polygons of, of police precincts. Um, and, and, the, and the challenge here is that um, the, the polygons that correspond to, to, to your theory of interest uh, are not always going to be available, and, and, and nor are they always going to have the data that you need in them. Um, and, um, and so you may want to have, uh, you, you may want to conduct your analysis uh, completely at the level of, of police precincts, but then you find that a lot of the data that you need, say on crime, crime may be reported at the county level, uh, but you want to look at variation across police precincts. Um, and so that's that's the basic of, basis of the challenge here. In a, in a different context, say um, for modeling weather patterns or, or climate, 
uh, a grid cell might be a more appropriate unit of analysis, uh, something that, you know, that represents kind of a continuous surface, continuous plane uh, o o over which uh, values change, uh, you know, more smoothly than, than perhaps they do across, uh, across, you know, state or county lines. Um, so all this completely depends on, on, on what theory you're testing. Um, there is no, there's no one choice and the use case uh, completely depends on the hypothesis being advanced. Um, in terms of generalizing from the Monte Carlo simulations, um, so um, there are of course limits to this. Uh, the, the reason that we adopted the Monte Carlo simulation in this case is because we thought that generalizing just from the case, from the case of Georgia and, uh, and Sweden uh, only takes us so far. Um, there are regional quirks with um, you know, with both countries in terms of how they administer elections and how they draw their maps. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and also those three sets of units in each case does not cover the full range of, of values, potential values for RS and RN. And so the Monte Carlo simulation in this case gives us a, an admittedly very artificial context in which uh, to evaluate how nesting and scale vary and um, and of, of course, real boundaries do not look like decent polygons. Um, this, this is just a really more of a computational uh, convenience more than anything else. We can certainly draw uh, more complex polygons that look more like real life administrative units. And, uh, and, and the Monte Carlo simulations are also constrained in terms of their generalizability by the fact that all these analyses are bounded within this rectangular box. So, so the study area is like, is a rectangular one where, where, no, where there are no bodies of water or no weird coastal features. Um, so those are, you know, that, that is an area in which uh, we might want to you know, run a different set of uh, Monte Carlo simulations with more complex and more irregularly shaped polygons. Um, but um, yeah, but for, the, for our purposes, uh, yeah, our hope is that you know, if we just reiterate this, this routine uh, tens of thousands of times, eventually like, that will cover enough ground uh, that we will cover you know, a sufficient uh, critical mass of, of use cases. But that's, uh, um, that at least was our hope. Um, yeah. now, Ken, do you want to add anything to this? No, no, I think you covered it. Um... I didn't know if I interpreted your first question correctly, whether you were talking about the political boundaries, which are human made, and then the, the sort of artificial grid cells, which are, are also human made, but they're made for some scientific purpose. Like you wanna study weather or geology or something like that. There are people, researchers who want to use data from both sources. So policies about ecology might be done at the political unit level, whereas the results of the weather in combination with the policies are measured at the grid cell level by satellites or by some, you know, whatever. And so you're, you're often, I mean, that's part of what we're up to is the fact that your, your data generated by politics, economics, the social world are often measured at the human drawn, funny shaped city boundaries or something like that. So that's the point. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, and it, right. It'd be different for something like soil or, or, well, soil can change too, but something like topography, which doesn't change. He was saying, um, if you couldn't hear that, uh, that it makes sense for something that's transient, like weather that changes over time. Um, it makes sense to, to, to think about this when it's something that's fixed where, you know, there's a mountaintop there and it's always there, right? It's a little different. Let me see if anything else has come through. Anybody? Online Q&A. None? Yeah, go for it. 
Hi, thanks for the talk. I was wondering if you have a recommendation on maybe a lower uh, limit of RS and RN values that you might think is appropriate or, or a, a limit that you would say below this is inappropriate to use this analysis because the, the overlap is just, it's no good. Or if, you, if you've looked into uh, any analysis of that at all. Can I take just a stab and then I think you should, at a really low level, you're really in an intensive ecological inference problem. You're, you have aggregate measures and you're trying to make inferences about smaller units, including individuals or tiny little plots of land or something. Um, in those cases, that literature has, they're not solutions, but attempts to improve inference. You really need some kind of information variant, um, some kind of covariate across um, as small a unit as possible that you know is a, is a correlate of the thing you care about. But anyway, Yuri, I don't know if you wanna, it, at the really low levels, it's really an EI problem, right, Yuri? Yeah, it really is. Um, and, and there's no hard, fast uh, you know, you know, rule of thumb that, that, that we can use. Um, I would say that um, the, these uh, measures are probably the most useful when comparing uh, alternative uh, solutions to your data needs. If you're, uh, uh, if, 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 if you're considering several options between uh, like what types of units to, to conduct your analysis on, um, you know, picking the one with the, with the higher RS and RN uh, will give you more reliable results. Um, although, I, I mean, I would also say that most of the variation that we see in our simulations uh, most of the drop-off happens like in, in the first, you know, uh, in the first third of the distribution where um, there's a, um, so, 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 so basically uh, after you get past like 0.3 or 0.4, um, there's, there's a bit of a declining return uh, to scale here uh, in that, um, you know, the curve begins to flatten out uh, if, uh, if, if you're looking at say like, um, the effect on correlation or the effect on, uh, on RMSC. Um, but I mean, there are still marginal improvements to be had. The closer you get to one, the better off you are. Um, but uh, yeah, but, but I, would, I would say that, uh, it, yeah, probably values of, of 0.3 or 0.4 are not necessarily terrible, but um, I mean, a lot just depends on what the alternative is. If the alternative is nothing, then, then okay, I guess. Uh, you know, just, just, just be aware of the potential pitfalls that you're, that you're jumping into. Um, but, but yeah, there, is, there, there tends to be this, this, uh, uh, this declining return to, uh, you know, to relative scale and nesting that you get past like the first third of, of the distribution. Okay, I don't think I'm seeing anything else coming through. So maybe I give us three minutes back. <laughs> Yuri, thanks so much for joining us from, uh, from a distance. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to give the talk. And uh, Ken, thanks for being here as well. Thanks, Yuri. Thanks for doing that. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, James. Thanks for organizing. And thank you all for coming. Sure. It was fun. All right. Have, yeah, have a good day, everyone.